Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the World Economic Forum, the Confederation of uh, Indian Industry, and also CNBC, my honor, also my pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning for this uh, panel. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like a, a show of hands. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about Davos, about the World Economic Forum, as sort of like the UN, but actually even better. It's the UN with rock stars, right, which has been the experience. Uh, in Delhi, uh, it's slightly different, but also has star power. How many of you have availed yourselves of the opportunity to either meet, talk to, uh, press the flesh, get autographs from, even take wifis with, selfies with, uh, some of the ho Bollywood royalty uh, that's been here, uh, the esteemed director, Karan Johar, the IT starlets, I understand, Alia Bhatt, uh, Deepika Padukone as well. Just a, raise, uh, just a show of hands. Oh, come on. That's all? I met Karan. You met Karan. Excellent. Good, good. Well, I tell you what. We have our own stars, our own luminaries on stage with us here. I'd like to introduce them uh, to you in no particular order, uh, but ladies first, of course. Uh, Shobhna Kamenei is president and the first woman president of the CII, Confederation of Indian Industry. She also wears another hat as the head of uh, Apollo Pharma. Uh, next to her is Adi Godred, chairman of the Godred Group, a giant and a legend in Indian business who actually needs no introduction. Uh, Sanjeev Bajaj is uh, next. Uh, MD of Bajaj FinServe, uh, and last but not least, of course, a good friend of CNBC and somebody I used to talk to regularly, uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, now Principal Economic Advisor at the Ministry of Finance, Government of India in a previous life at DB Deutsche Bank. We used to uh, have some, some great conversations, and I'm sure it will be the same uh, today. So we've met the panel. Let me frame today's discussion. For me, the central question hanging over this entire summit has been India, the economy, what's happened, right? Because a year ago, the big headline was India, the fastest growing big economy in the world. At some points in time, faster even than China. And then, well, what a difference 12 months or a year makes because we've gone through now five straight quarters of slowing growth. We've seen inflation more than double so what happened and why? So a lot of people like to finger point as the culprits, okay, was it GST in July? Was it demonetization back last uh, November? I think there's a consensus that in both cases, the shocks to the system bit harder and deeper than a lot of people had ever imagined or expected, including, might be fair to say, uh, the planners themselves, but that the Indian economy is resilient enough to, to get over this. So, okay, that's fine. What about the banking system? I've seen some stats that are staggering. Credit growth in India is the weakest, slowest, lowest since independence. That's not good. Credit cycle is not working. CapEx cycle obviously is not working. Companies are screaming, especially SMEs. They can't get the money they need to, to operate to continue to do so. So that's the stage. I want to talk about uh, the whys, but more importantly, look forward and talk about the how do you fix it? What do you do? What should the government do? What should the private sector do? What do they actually need from the government? What should they be doing themselves? And I'd like to start with the government side first, Sanjeev, and uh, ask about uh, the twin shocks first, GST as well as uh, demonetization. Fair to say that the impact, especially the negative impact, has been deeper, harder than even the government had anticipated? Actually, uh, you need to see this, uh, I mean, of course we acknowledge that there's been a slowdown, but you need to see it in the context. I mean, a large number of very major uh, reforms have been rolled out very, very quickly. I mean, whether you like demonetization or not, that was a very bold step. You've had GST on top of that, and a major cleanup of the banking sector using a brand new bankruptcy law, um, which is, a, some would argue, a harsh way of doing it, but the point is, if you want a entrepreneurial economy, you do need a clear exit system. Mm. So all of these things have been introduced uh, pretty much one after the other. Mm. And yes, some degree of disruption happens as a result of it. Um, did we expect it? Yes, we did expect some degree of uh, a downturn from introducing all these. This systems. much? This bad? Well, you, when you are dealing with so many uh, sort of steps like this, unprecedented uh, measures, you have to expect unintended consequences. So 
you know, there was a wide array of outcomes that were expected. Would you concede, though, that the timing, right, November and July, as well as, more importantly, I think, the execution, uh, there's been a little bit of fall down on, on both fronts. So I think uh, um, you have to understand that when you're introducing radical changes like this, you, as I said, you have to expect unintended consequences of all kinds. And I think I have spoken about this uh, in past, that the only way you could have introduced something like the huge cleanup of the banking system or GST for that, for that matter was to not keep thinking about it as we did with GST for 20 odd years, mm. but to actually do it and fix it along the way. Mm. Sort of a feedback loop based uh, approach. Now this may look sort of uh, awkward in the short run, but this is the only real way you can introduce major changes in a country like India. Mm. So it was a huge, I mean, political step uh, to step into the water and then learn to swim. So there was no quote unquote good way to do this. There was bound there was to never be going to be pain any, in any case. Absolutely. You clean up the banking system, for example. We right. had a long culture of keeping uh, evergreening loans forever. Now we suddenly stall that whole culture of doing business. We begin cleaning up the banking system, you actually use liquidation as a possible route of resolution. Uh, never been done before. So of course, you have essentially you're shifting the paradigm on which India's uh, uh, economic uh, activity is done. The whole culture of doing business is being changed. And yes, it, it will be painful for a short uh, period of time. Okay. But I think you need to also see the other thing in context that don't just look at the growth slowdown. By the way, it's not 2.7, it's 5.7. It's pretty strong growth rates. Still. Indeed, yes. Secondly, uh, all our macro stability numbers are dramatically uh, improved. I mean, just look at, we are sitting on more than 400 billion worth of foreign exchange reserves. The current account deficit for the last financial year was below 1%. Maybe it'll drift up a little bit this year. Um, the <clears throat> uh, inflation, which has been a perennial problem in India, was double digits a few years ago is now for the for this financial year has averaged at 2.5 percent mm -hmm. unprecedented again so the macro stability numbers are radically improved yes growth has slowed down but on the other hand we've introduced these um, major major steps mm. which uh, everybody tells us is a good thing in the long run uh, so you know uh, the political leadership has taken the bold step of introducing them maybe very quickly uh, together, but is again willing to take some of the pain for it. So, government position, you think the economy is resilient enough to get over both of these shocks? Well, of course it is. I mean, as I said, our macro stability uh, indicators are dramatically improved. Now so, that, gro so growth will pick up in the succeeding Well, quarters? we are hoping so, and I hope to hear from the others about this. But uh, let me point out that it is not that the government is unaware of the uh, problems created by introduction of all of this. Mm. So as I said, since this is a feedback loop based uh, policy making system, uh, the, the, the problems created by the introduction of GST are well understood, particularly those relating to exporters, small exporters, SMEs, mm. and they are being fixed. Okay. So yes, first iteration, problems, feedback taken, and will be fixed. And mm. it will be done in days, not, not weeks. Wow, days, not weeks. Okay, I'll, I'll hold you to that. Shobna, on the ground, uh, if you can take off uh, your CII hat and talk to us about uh, with your Apollo Pharma hat on, how, how bad has it been? The pinch or, uh, or the impact from uh, both demonetization as well as GST. Uh, demonetization definitely created stress in the system, especially in the, in the tier two, tier three, towns and, uh, and and I think it was widespread. We didn't realize the impact would go on for more than, you know, we thought it would just be one quarter. It went on, but, but you know, we don't want to comment on, on uh, demon that was done. It was done for reasons that uh, definitely some positive. If you see, we've got the largest inflow of uh, retail funds that have come into mutual funds. Uh, into mutual funds. This was never before. Mm. And that's, I think, really spurring our capital markets. So there, there's some good, there's lots of bad too. But having said that, GST is a tax that industry wanted. GST is for industry. And so we were prepared to understand what would be the impact of this. Um, and, and if we can get it done in, in two quarters, that's outstanding. 
no one else in the world has been able to get over GST because long term, we knew, and Adi, of course, is the greatest proponent within mm -hmm. our confederation about GST. He, he's been championing it for the last 10 years. Mm. So it's nothing new to us. Okay. And, and But what GST has done is that it's formalized a lot of the network. So for us, for instance, industries that, that already were kind of organized did, uh, and their supply chain was <coughs> organized, it was not too difficult to transition. For instance, the auto or some of the... But, but the smaller unorganized... That was a big challenge for them because they were never in the in a tax system. Suddenly they're in there, and suddenly you're in a, actually a fairly complex system because GST requires you to fill in so many more forms. Mm. So the compliance has been an issue for everybody. We have to get over it. Mm. I think that it'll take you know. So so a lot of the big companies are struggling with the compliance and the number of forms. Mm -hmm. The smaller companies are just understanding the implications. But what's going to really happen is a reorganization of our entire uh, supply chain network. Yeah. You know, it, those are the opportunities that you'll see, the consolidation of formal retail, the, uh, the movement of goods. Mm. So this entire transition in India is for the future, and I think that's where the GDP will kick up almost two points, if we can get it Wow. Right. Okay, for the future and for uh, the good. Uh, Mr. Godrich. Because of, let's say, GST, do you expect your group companies to gain market share? Well, I'm not sure whether we will gain market share, but we will certainly gain sales and profits. Okay. Uh, uh, we've already started seeing that from the July, September quarter. Yeah. Now, I think we did have a slowdown post demonetization. For obvious reasons, there was a shortage of cash. But we were recovering quite well. And I think we've been, this whole question mark about the Indian economy has come about because we showed a relatively slow growth rate, GDP growth rate of 5.7% mm. in the April June quarter. In my view, April and May, we don't have monthly GDP growth rates, were reasonably good. June growth rate was rather low. Mm. And the reason is, in the GST manufacturing sector, there were considerable number of items where the new GST rate is less than the combination of the earlier excise and VAT rates. So obviously, there was a destocking of those items and lower production and clearance of those items, mm. which would affect the GDP growth rate in that month. Mm. I, th I think people don't seem to have gone into that detail, okay. which I think will considerably recover in the July-September period. And I expect, like Shobna, I expect the second half mm. to show a very good growth rate. So instead of destocking, we will eventually start to see restocking, is what you're saying? We're well, not restocking, just better sales, better offtake. Mm. Some restocking too. Okay. But generally good offtake. Okay. And I can't talk much about it now because we haven't declared our results for the July-September quarter, but all our companies have done quite well yeah. back to a good track with the GST regime. And, and Adi, we had an early uh, festival season yes. also, yeah. so that kicked up. Ah, yeah. right, okay. And what does it mean for Bajaj Group businesses, the GST? You see, any such large step will have some initial difficulty and noise. Mm. Now, when you're going to change what has probably be, been the biggest tax reform in any country globally, mm. that pain exists for some period of time. And we are going through that pain, and that's what we are reacting to. Now, whether it takes one quarter, three quarters, who knows? You know, people like Sanjeev uh, would know that better, or mm. we will see. The impact or the net change of that is going to be significantly positive as everybody else on the panel is saying as well. Okay. And we will see that. So I'm sure when we are sitting here maybe a year down the line, uh, we will be talking at a, with, a, with a very different positive feel than what we are today. Mm. And just where you started from, Martin, uh, see, we don't want governments that only talk. We want a government that acts. Mm. This government acts. It has taken a number of big steps. And on financial services side, Sanjeev has already referred to some of the big steps. Mm. Now, some of them are not going to work. And 
let's be honest, demonetization has not worked. And there is a fallout of that. The intention was right. It partly will... Oh, you're change. saying demonetization has not worked? In what sense, though? Fulfilling which of the government's promises? So, so for example, when you talked about demonetization, what were we trying to do? One, we were trying to uncover black money. We still have to see that. Maybe we'll see evidence of that later. We've not seen much of that. Okay. The second, what we were trying to do, was to push the entire system to go more digital, to go cashless. Mm. That move has started. But see, we can't expect it to happen overnight. So we can see, especially in my industry, how digitization is starting to make a very big difference, especially when you go outside the top 100, 150 cities, mm. where it was difficult to reach money efficiently. That's changing now. Third was the overall mood. It did create a negative mood. Yeah. But the flip side of that is GST. I think it's a very positive step. Mm. And we must be critical where we need to be critical, but we must also encourage, because the last thing we want is a government or a country that does not take those big steps. Mm. Incremental steps will not take us back to 9, 9.5% 9 GDP. Mm. Uh, Sanjeev, back to you. Demonetization uh, hasn't really... Jury still out, uh, I think, is what uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sanjeev is trying to say. Some people might say that it's backfired in the sense that if the government had been hoping to kill or start to kill the black economy, it's not working. You take a look at what's been happening with gold, what's been happening with, let's say, luxury watches. Smuggling is on the rise. I think uh, you need to see it in a wider context. First of all, uh, what happened is that the cash to GDP ratio has distinctly, the trajectory of that has distinctly changed. So I think, uh, of course, only with time will we be able to show that they has that trajectory continued down that line. So let's hold up uh, uh, horses on that one. Mm. But I think you need to take the ho uh, this uh, demonetization in the context of many other things that are being done. So what is being attempted? What is being attempted by Prime Minister Modi is to create a high-trust, rule-based society and move it away from a rent-seeking, patronage-based society. This is the wider idea, which he keeps repeating. You know, he'll talk about the new India. What is this new India? It's this shift from a rent-seeking, um, patronage-based economy to this rule-based, entrepreneurship-based economy. So what he's doing is he's creating the framework for this. So various frames, one is of course the, the attempt to squeeze out black money, but at the same time he's introducing bankruptcy laws, i.e. exits. Uh, he's cleaning up the banking system, introducing mm. a GST-based um, um, taxation system, uh, which uh, creates an internal market. In, uh, remember, didn't have a proper internal market. Mm. So he's creating an inter internal market, but also simultaneously lots of paperwork, uh, paperwork, paper trails that can be used to keep track of uh, <clears throat> the transactions and the circulation of money. So what is being attempted here is a much wider thing than just, you know, a at random attack on one, uh, uh, at one point and then something else somewhere else. You have to see the wider sort of uh, uh, model of uh, economic uh, management mm. that is being fundamentally changed. So in that context, demonetization was one part of it. So is GST, so is the cleanup of the banks, so is bankruptcy, so is uh, the, 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 you know, we had a uh, real estate sector with all kinds of problems, uh, accusations of robber baron behavior and so on. So we have a new rate when, when will real estate be brought into the tax net? So there is something called RERA, I don't know if you are aware, uh, Real Estate Regulation Act, which has come through. So there are many, many other things that are being done. So if you see it only in you know, each of these in silos, then they may or may not work. But if you look at the wider context of shifting India fundamentally to a different kind of economy, a rule-based, trust-based economy, um, then you will see how all of these pieces fit together. Mm. I want to connect the dots and look much, much further down. Shobha, uh, Shobha brought in uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, portfolio uh, inflows, foreign money coming into India. Uh, the flows are looking pretty strong, pretty good. And uh, from your previous life at uh, DB, I think you'd have a lot to say about this as well. For many, many years, for decades, in fact, the attraction of Indian equities, listed entities, <coughs> was ROE. ROEs were, are still actually stunning compared to developed market averages, compared to even emerging market averages, right? But over time, as the Indian economy uh, opens up, cost of business goes down, etc., there is a more than uh, good likelihood that on average ROEs will come down 
and it'll be taken out of the ROEs of some of the big companies which we have represented uh, right here. Is that fair? Uh, it's a possibility. I mean, uh, we will see a return on equity. Also remember, this economy is hugely capital starved. Uh, hopefully the idea is that once you get the economy, uh, you know, the banking system cleaned up and expanding again, foreign capital coming in, um, you know, uh, the, the enforcement of contracts, et cetera, improve, um, you know, the use of capital will also go up. So even naturally, equity will fall. Uh, you know, a much faster growing economy and uh, so on. So, you know, there are pros and cons. It's very difficult to generalize uh, on this. Yeah, Sanjeev, are you concerned that your ROE, that your, your listed entities will become over time less attractive to foreign investors, ironically, because of uh, some of these structural reforms we've been talking about? So, Martin, very simplistically, when I think about it, why are our ROEs disproportionately higher? One, our cost of capital is significantly higher than developed markets. Second, there is a cost of doing business. There is significant inefficiency in the entire system. So the few companies or the many companies that manage to break through that get a much larger pie to share. Including Bajaj, right? yes. And including us yeah. um, in the good times, right? in the bad times, not necessarily. So. <laughs> the third is, as Sanjeev said, we are a, still a huge growth economy. We have a huge underserved market. So that additional profit is required to reinvest. Now, if I'm in a developed market where essentially for my products and services, we've reached by and large saturation point. My incremental investment only goes into innovation, into technology, doesn't go into fixed investment for more capacity. Mm. As, as, and I think India is a far way away before we reach saturation in these levels. So you will see those higher ROEs, but it's also a reflection of a higher level of risk that we companies are taking mm. compared to the developed markets. So what you're basically, what you've been describing basically is what uh, investors call the, the, the India premium. Are, are you concerned that it could fall though? If it falls? Yes. I think that's good because it will then mean that our basic processes, our foundation blocks of, of doing business in, over here have got much stronger. Mm. The whole process has become smoother, then you don't need the risk premium. Okay. Mr. Gottridge? No, I think uh, uh, the Indian equity markets should grow quite well. I think one problem is, one of the problems we are facing is that large Indian companies, especially in the infrastructure space, were depending too much on debt in the past. Mm. That has caused some of the problems. We need to be more equity oriented. This calendar year, for example, the raising of equity capital by new companies is, is at record levels, which is a good sign. Mm. And I think uh, that will help our future progress a lot. But the opportunities in India are huge. Not just things like consumer durables, like autos or appliances, etc., where penetration is still very low in India. And the opportunity for increased penetration as incomes increase is very high. Mm. Even in fast-moving consumer goods, the penetration is very low in India. And the opportunity for growth is a lot. If you look at packaged branded products, there are only three packaged branded products which are fully penetrated, which means every household uses. One is toilet soap, the other is some form of detergent, and the third is matchsticks. Everything else is underpenetrated, including toothpaste, shampoo, food products are very underpenetrated. A lot of loose food is bought. So the growth potential in all these fairs in India is huge, which will add to returns. Mm -hmm. And I think the foreign investors who are putting a lot of faith in the future of India are going to do extremely well because India is on a path of growth. Okay. Yeah, and I don't think we should be diverted by the fact that because of the major reforms which are needed for strong future growth, mm -hmm. we have been temporarily been stymied a little bit. Okay, temporary, these uh, recent shocks to the system. What about, Mr. Gardner, the banking system in India? It is, it's not functioning, really. That is a problem. Yes. And I think that needs to be rectified. I think if this... Uh, insolvency procedure works out, maybe in a while it will get solved. Mm. In the meanwhile, that's one of the reasons why a lot of companies are raising more equity capital. Mm. 
And I think we've got to get used to the fact that this has happened all over the world, in all the developed countries. A lot of businesses start as family-run businesses. So the families are reluctant to dilute control. Mm. But in the long run, you have to dilute control by raising more equity. And now if you look at the Western world, a lot of the companies are very broadly held. So I don't think it should be a problem. People will raise equity. Okay. And I think we are seeing it grow in India. All right. It's, it, it's natural. It happens. It's a, it's a natural uh, evolution, I understand. Back to the banks themselves. Should the government not be budgeting more to recapitalize banks? I think uh, the first part of the cleanup, which is recognizing the uh, bad assets, uh, beginning to provision them, taking some of them through the bankruptcy and insolvency process, that part of it is now well underway. Now, the step two, consequently, which you just alluded to, which is the recapitalization and getting these banks running again, that is something that will be done in the next few months. Uh, the government is fully aware that we need a much larger banking system um, by a factor of multiples of what it is today. Mm. I mean, India's banking system is way too small for our economy today and certainly uh, too small for future. So we understand that our banking system needs to expand significantly by a factor of multiples from where it is now. So we will have to recapitalize it, absolutely. Mm. And there are many uh, options that are there on the, on the table. Uh, which range from <clears throat> uh, creating uh, recapitalization bonds, i.e. taking out money from the banks themselves and putting it back. Um, there, are, there is the option, of course, of uh, diluting down the government to, say, something like 52%, uh, which will still be public sector banks, but, uh, you know, the sh shareholding will decline. Some of it could come from the budget itself. There are many mm. options, by the way, mm. um, and all of them will be explored in combination. But this recapitalization issue is well understood and will be done soon. In, in, in terms of number of institutions, is India overbanked? Does consolidation make sense? So this is a somewhat different issue from cleaning up the banks. I think uh, uh, many, many people confuse the two. Um, there are something like 21, 22 public sector banks. Um, there is a case for uh, reducing that number uh, for commercial reasons. Mm. By the way, however, Adding two uh, inefficient banks does not lead to a bigger efficient bank. So this cleaning up the banking issue is the first priority. Um, we also need to, to consolidate some of these uh, large number of uh, banks. But be uh, clear, we are not going to reduce these down to, you know, some people think like four or five national champions. That is not at all the case. We recognize that that would lead to too many, too big to fail banks. Right now we have one really big bank, which is the State Bank of India, and then the much, others are much, much smaller. We do not want to create a large number of them, then we would have a real problem in mm. terms of concentration of risk. So the numbers will be reduced uh, in, 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 in terms of consolidation, but somewhere to the 10 to 15 range mm. from 22, um, we are not going to take it too far down that road. Yeah. But do not confuse the consolidation issue, which is a somewhat longer term uh, commercial decision mm. from the cleaning of the banks and recapitalization, which is a much more urgent issue in order to get that banking system running again. You mentioned the government considering selling down stakes in uh, some banks and becoming a minority shareholder, but still... Uh, not, not necessarily no. a minority. That's why I said 52%. Ah. They will still be a public sector bank. So okay. you know, there may be specific instances where we may go all the way. But generally, as things stand, uh, what is being considered is selling down the stake to around about 52%. So controversial, uh, 52 but no less, right? Yes. Raises for the, the question being, yes. for the time being. Does yes. the, should the government be in banking? Because if you take a look back, the reason the banking system is so choked and clogged with NPAs, as you call them here, or NPLs as they're known uh, elsewhere, is the fact that uh, in terms of risk management, Things didn't work so well, did they? This is the legacy of mainly infrastructure loans gone wrong, where the projects didn't quite play out the way that people had expected. I think we have a somewhat different view on this. Okay. You see, there are risks to private banking and there are to public banking. There are different kinds of risks. Um, you know, after all, the, the rest of the world had private banks and you had a crisis in 2007 and 9, uh, 2008. Um, and so, it's not as if private uh, banks uh, do not have their own problems. Now, in India, it may be, the, I think it's a fair point that maybe 
70% seven, of it of the banking sector being uh, public sector maybe overdoing it, but there is a space for public sector banks. They serve certain kinds of social uh, uh, um, uh, roles, mm -hmm. but also from a purely commercial uh, or economic perspective, mm -hmm. um, the fact is that they, 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 they have a certain, the risks they, uh, th that they run are somewhat different from those that the private sector runs. No, so now if enough. you want to spread your risk as an economy, then it is a good idea to have a mix of various kinds of uh, banking institutions because um, while they will all have different kinds of problems, the fact that they, they do not all have the same kind of problem at the same point in time means mm. that in a sense you've diversified the, the, uh, the, the, the risk uh, of the system. So it's fair enough to say that maybe the private sector banking should play a greater role. Mm. I think that's, I think most people will like, accept that. Okay. But to say that public sector banking has no role at all uh, is perhaps uh, going too far. Yeah, but it's very different like from say um, airlines industry or some other places where, you know, right now one could say that the government shouldn't perhaps be running airlines mm. okay. or, or hotels or something. Okay. The, the banking system is a, is a is, uh, and the financial system generally is a specific uh, and very specialized part of the economy with very special um, role to play. Mm -hmm. And the public sector and regulation has an important role to play in it. Okay, fair enough. So we've talked about the banking system. We've talked about the twin shocks recently, the, the big government reforms, GST, demonetization. Uh, and I've been having a go at you for, for far too long, I think. Let's bring the rest of the panel in on this. Uh, Shona, what would you like to see the government do more of to help CII, Indian industry, as well as your own business, Apollo? Um, the big thing, the big ticket, if we, is ease of doing business uh, and policy clarity. I think that the government has been, they, they change frequently some of these, uh, some of their policies that have been taken off late. And uh, more than pricing, like for instance, the uh, they've, they've started to regulate and put caps on healthcare and things, you know, that are detrimental to the extreme need that is required <coughs> that private sector comes in at 70%. What we should do is to encourage growth and see where you can move the needle because India requires uh, many things, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's more uh, process, uh, whether it's more, um, you know, food or uh, healthcare, education, all these are aspects. And infrastructure, if you see the stress in the telecom and the power sectors. So I think that we need to take a look at how this is being done. Mm. And, and then the ease of doing business, states have started moving, but, but it's not really, you know, if, if, you, if you look at it, the defense sector that was supposed to be the big one that will create jobs, that will open up the economy, how far have we moved on that? And many of these areas, if you look at it, you know, like, uh, uh, I think that it's important that we, that, that the government looks at this very critically. And these are things that will actually help all the other things of demonetization, GSD, banking, that we spoke about are important. But now uh, companies need to look inward. And the big ticket that we can never, never ignore is jobs. Mm. How many jobs are we creating? Mm -hmm. How many jobs does India need? And this is the kind of, uh, the, this is the needle that we constantly have to push. And, and it's together. It's government and private have that priority. And unless we make it easier for us to do business, it's going to be tougher for us to create jobs. Okay, let's take a step back and talk about this whole issue of jobs and how it's related to growth. Because I was talking to, I can't remember who it was, but I was having a fascinating conversation with them. Um, let's say China, for example. Back in the day, not too long ago, the magic number for China was 8%. That was how fast they had to grow the economy in order to create enough jobs to absorb, I think it was 10 million new entrants into the workforce every okay. year. Otherwise, you get social stability problems, better known in their most extreme as riots, and you've got political instability, which is what the communists don't want, right? In India's case, my question is, at 5.7% growth, if I'm not mistaken, I think about a million people join the workforce uh, every month, which works out to 10 to 12 million a year, the government's number crunching at 5.7. Are you creating enough jobs to absorb this number of people? So this is a ma area of major debate, partly uh -huh. because um, we don't have uh, good employment uh, data in India. 
uh, something that we've been working on trying to collect this data. So there is a lot of anecdotal data floating around. It's an issue of major concern to us to make sure that jobs are created in, in the, uh, 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 quickly mm. uh, and on a sustained basis. Uh, but um, it is also the case that, frankly, uh, the statistics to, for this are very poor, and it's something that we are concerned about and trying to fix. Okay, another way to approach this might be to look at CapEx. As far as I know, the CapEx cycle has not started. It's kind of dead because the credit cycle has, is going nowhere. Uh, the Bajaj Group, how does your CapEx look? Because CapEx, part of that is, is creating jobs. It would have to be, right? So again, the two significant businesses that end up uh, using additional capital on a regular basis, one is the manufacturing business, the automobile business, and there again, uh, we are only now starting to see higher growth. So there's uh, greater consumer demand coming in. And this will follow, as you know, there's a lag effect there. So it will follow, a, a CapEx cycle will follow this down the line. The second big user is our lending business. Um, and we've just gone and raised about $800 million uh, last month to take care of the next two to three years growth. Uh, because here we are financing, so we are enabling sales. now. <laughs> As we've seen in the last, I would say, six, eight, nine months, uh, consumer demand on the ground has been muted. It is starting to improve now, and we, are, we have a big festival season coming up. Um, so we all geared up for, again, record volumes over there. But just rewinding uh, back a little bit, uh, Martin, of all the big moves I think this government has made, if we have to really start creating jobs for 12 million people every year and many more who don't have jobs today, the one large challenge still left is labor reform. And this is something that the central government tried, but as we know, this is for states to execute. Mm. This is a big move, and there are unions, there are pressures, but if we are able to cut through the whole set of issues relating to it and go ahead and do this, there will be some pain again, but I think this will be the single biggest additional driver for employment. So bluntly, you're talking about giving companies, private companies, greater discretion and flexibility to hire and fire as they choose or need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bluntly, right? Absolutely. And we have to keep in mind the amount of investment, effort, and time that goes in training people. Yeah. So once companies have trained and employed them, we're not just going to fire them for the sake of firing them. Mm. And look at it this way. Look at a company like Bajaj Auto. In 1990, we made a million vehicles mm. with 25,000 employees. Mm. We now make close to 4 million with 6,000 permanent employees. So, of course, there's tremendous productivity. But in the with the current labor rules, most large companies are very careful about adding additional people. Mm. That will change dramatically. Plus, the protection that uh, an employee gets by coming under a formal umbrella mm -hmm. is not available to most people in the small-scale and uh, mid-scale sector mm. because... Uh, those, uh, those are all the so-called contracted unofficial employment. Okay, Mr. Gondrich, your businesses are, are fairly labor-intensive uh, as well. What, what is the issue? Is it lack of labor reform? Is it a government issue? Or, or is organized labor? Are unions too strong in India? Well, there's a little bit of all of it, but our companies have employed more people over the last couple of years. You've added work. And okay. we, particularly, we've added a lot of women ah. to our workforce. So that's a good thing. But one point I want to bring out, we talked of a lot of resources, etc. Yeah. One resource India needs to pay a lot of attention to, to efficiently use is land. Not too many people realize we are among the larger countries of the world, the most densely populated, except for Bangladesh. Mm. We are more densely populated than Japan. And how we use our land efficiently is to my mind very important. In agriculture, it's important. Animal husbandry, for example, if we pay a lot of attention to, we can increase farmer incomes without increasing land requirements. Just for example, in housing, we are very inefficient in how much housing or real estate we build on unit land compared to most other countries in the world, despite being the most densely populated country. Mm. So we need to pay a lot of attention to use a resource which is so scarce very well, and it'll get scarcer. We'll get more and more densely populated. We are three times as densely populated as China and 10 times as densely populated as the United States. What is the one thing you would like to see the government do? 
on that issue. Well, there are, there are many things. But all I'm saying is, because we are involved in real estate, we find that current policies, mainly by the state government, because it's a state subject, are inefficient in the use of land, for example. I mean, uh, he is absolutely right. I mean, uh, in fact, we have uh, building codes and city urban designs which are fundamentally flawed. Um, and we will hopefully soon have a national urbanization policy which will look into some of these issues. Um, we have, uh, you know, setback rules and so on which are completely outdated ideas about how to design cities. We need denser cities. We need uh, more efficient cities, walkable cities, uh, rather than these somewhat... Uh, theoretical ideas from the 1950s which have got somehow embedded into our uh, building codes and urban uh, design master plans. Mm -hmm. So absolutely agree, land use is critical. Okay. But sorry, Please. Pardon, Sanjeev and, and Adi, do you really see what happened in Mumbai? So first is fix the infrastructure of those cities before we can talk about, you know, bringing more people into them. And I think the exciting thing is that we're creating all the, the uh, 500 more cities. So I agree with you on how we use land, but I'm, uh, while we're doing that, we should also understand our infrastructure issues. Are Absolutely. Okay. And urban planning. It must be simultaneous. Yeah, it has to you be simultaneous. You can't say do this first so, and then yeah, do some, that. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I get scared when we think about these. No, so what, first of all, we need to have an honest discussion about the need for density. Once we have an honest discussion about the need for density, then we can say, okay, if we have this density, this is what is the required infrastructure. Unfortunately, what we do is we have this somewhat hypocritical view of the way we design our cities, is that we have this low-rise cities inspired by Le Corbusier and Chandigarh and so on. Frankly, those kind of cities are completely inefficient. Uh, Chandigarh is uh, totally the worst possible design for a country like India. So what but, you but it is beautiful, though. <laughs> well, if, if, for what if, that's if, worth, I don't know. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's not a city. It's a it's a subsidy scheme for civil servants. So the thing is that you need a much tighter uh, plan for uh, cities. Uh, and once you have agreed to that, and then you can build the infrastructure necessary for it. I mean, Hong Kong is very very dense, but it functions. I mean, Singapore. On the ground, doesn't feel like it is very densely populated, but just go to a tall building. In fact, it is unbelievable how tightly packed it is. Indeed. Um, so the point is, you can have actually uh, fairly, uh, if you design for it and accept that this is going to be the way you're going to go, then you can design for all of these things. Mm. They're actually well-known principles that can be used to work for density. Okay. All right. So in uh, Mumbai also, please. for example, with the Sea Link and the Eastern Freeway, much Once you do that, it's much, much better, much easier. But, but I, I am able flooding. to travel faster in Mumbai today than 50 years ago. Oh. But the urban planning still, ha I think, yeah, in Mumbai and need, all these cities. needs to be coordinated. But, but having said that, the corollary of that is that we, it can bring in so many jobs in terms of construction. It's the construction jobs that went away during mm. demonetization. Mm -hmm. And those, if we can get them back even to the level of, you know, the, it used to be 30%. And if we can move that closer to 50, like China, mm. s most of the jobs were created in, in construction. So we need to do this. So it will come from building these cities, from infrastructure, mm. denser packing. So, so there's, there's a larger theme in whatever we're talking about. Is it really construction jobs which are hardest hit because of demonetization? Or, or my understanding is the farm sector, agriculture, farmers were hit far worse. No? From? Demonetization. It no, I have. don't think demonetization uh, had. In fact, uh, you know, there was enormous uh, political support uh, in rural areas for this move. Remember, in large parts of the country, these large notes are not widely used, especially in rural areas. So, yes, there was some problem because many of them had to go into town mm. in order to actually change their money. So, there was a logistical problem. Mm. But uh, in terms of popular support in rural areas for this move, it was quite okay. uh, widespread support for it. I mean, as I said, how many farmers have stacks of, you know, thousand rupee notes in the, uh, not many. Okay, fair enough, all right. Uh, I'm trying to be uh, very Swiss about uh, timekeeping here. We've got, uh, by my uh, watch here, about 10 minutes left. Maybe a good time to try and bring the audience in. If anybody has a question, oh, there we go. That, was, that didn't take too long. Uh, if you could just tell us who you are, uh, who you represent, and who your question is uh, aimed for, uh, I think ladies first, please. 
Is there a mic? There we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Noor Rizvi. I'm a doctoral scholar from IIT Delhi. My question is for Mr. Sanyal. First of all, I would like to appreciate you for your view that two weak banks cannot make a good, big, big efficient bank. Uh, but I have two questions here, your opinions basically. Uh, first of all, you were talking about the macroeconomic numbers. Uh, firstly, you said about the GDP growth, that is 5.7%. But there were speculations that probably the base year was changed while calculating the GDP number. So it was also mentioned some, in some reports that it was actually 3.7% if you actually look back at the previous formula. And uh, secondly, uh, you were mentioning about the inflation, uh, that you have tried to curb the inflation. Uh, very well, yes, definitely inflation has come down. But is it due to the um, decrease in the oil prices around the world that the inflation has come out, has come down, or is it because of the policies that India is having these days? Okay, let's tackle GDP first, if we could. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll uh, uh, take both, uh, they are connected. All right. Uh, first of all, on inflation, be very clear <clears throat> that now we have had uh, low oil prices for quite some time. If anything, on a year-on-year -year basis, maybe be actually higher now than they were a year ago. So the point is that the, 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 since inflation is compared to last year, that is by definition, so this effect of the low oil prices has rolled off long time ago. Uh, it may have accounted maybe in 2014-15 the uh, decline, but by now it is fed through. So the inflation number that you are now seeing is genuinely low. Um, uh, 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 and I think most uh, sensible economists will agree with that. Uh, this is no longer uh, oil price led. If anything, oil going forward uh, may have the other uh, opposite effect. Um, as far as uh, uh, the number and its credibility is concerned, uh, there are very good reasons why it was upgraded because the structure of our economy keeps changing. You need to keep changing the, uh, the way you calculate it. And this calculation uh, to suggest that somehow this was beneficial, let me point out that let's take the same basis of calculation um, of GDP and take it from when it started, which is I think 2011-12, uh, uh, something like that. And so uh, if you take that entire period, this government came to power in the middle of uh, May of 2016. Out, uh, uh, out of the uh, 13 quarters you've had, 10 of them, were uh, the growth rates were above 7%. Now you take the previous government uh, was there, same calculation. Out of the eight quarters uh, uh, that you had, numbers, uh, 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 four of those numbers were below 6%. So even if you took the uh, same GDP calculation, uh, you would see that there is distinctly higher growth rate since uh, this government took, uh, if you want to use this as the basis of it. So this uh, argument that th this particular calculation leads to higher numbers is uh, not at all correct. The growth rate uh, performance uh, of this government using th this uh, parameter is distinctly higher when compared to the same uh, parameters used for the period 2012 to 2014. So like to like, this is not necessarily, 5.7 on this uh, measurement is not like somehow uh, overstating the growth rate. There is a slowdown, it sh clearly shows in the numbers, uh, and the sa same numbers were being, uh, you know, you can use it over long periods of time. It'll give you a fair feel of the, uh, of the cycle. Well, let, let me steal a question from the audience, if you guys don't mind here, and uh, pose a cheeky question to you, uh, Sanjeev. Yes. Uh, I mean, in your previous life at DB, I, you, may have, you may have said something different, but now with your government hat on, inflation, latest read three, four, round about there, okay, that's pushing the upper bound of the comfort level of the RBI, which is at four even correct? No, that's not actually true. The midpoint oh. of the band is four. Okay. The comfort is two to six. So that is a fairly wide range. We are actually in the lower half of it even now. And uh, if you will be aware, we... They so were, do you think they should have uh, eased interest rates? Well, it's a matter of uh, some debate between the finance ministry economists and the RBI economists. <laughs> I'm not going to go back into it. And there are differences of opinions because, are well known. I asked because business, I mean, Shobna, CII, you guys were screaming for 100 basis points, one full percentage should point off. Six to five, should have done it. Government didn't. So, so as uh, I said, the, the finance ministry... There was ministry, a clear case for it. The oh. finance ministry economists have a certain view on it, which has been well expressed over time. 
Uh, and that is? Uh, well, that the rate should be lower. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to revisit that uh, debate again. Uh, Fair the, enough. In the end, it is the, re, uh, the, the, it is the RBI and the MPC's prerogative to set the interest rate. So this is actually, this we is can We can do no more than express an opinion. Indeed. Independence of the RBI is still uh, enshrined. Thank you. Sir. Uh, hi. Uh, this is uh, Srinivas from uh, Deutsche Bank. Uh, ah. you, we, <laughs> uh, hi, Sanjeev. <laughs> so question for you. Uh, we have a flexible inflation targeting framework right now. The nature of the framework is such that uh, any proclivity of uh, undertaking a fiscal expansion is usually met through an offsetting monetary policy response. That's the way the targeting framework is supposed to work. Now, uh, the point is that uh, we all know that real rates are pretty high uh, right now. But on a forecasted basis, you know, real rates might not actually be as low as they seem today. And we any, anyway know right now that growth is, is really so low. So uh, given this backdrop, uh, you know, is there a case uh, for, uh, you know, uh, basically providing some monetary support, maybe not through the interest rate side, but really through the currency, you know, ease monetary conditions by really having a much more competitive or basically a weaker currency. Is that out of the fiscal, monetary, and the external, the currencies part, if two of them seem to be constrained right now, could the currency actually be used, you know, to kind of give a fillip to exports and really give a push up to GDP? And that's the question. So is, is the finance ministry comfortable with the level of the rupee at this stage and, and the way it's, it's So first of all, again, this is an area where the Reserve Bank uh, prerogative, not ours. But let me point out that while um, obviously, uh, you know, an exchange rate that keeps appreciating is not helpful, um, it is also the case that, uh, you know, using the exchange rate by itself as a means to stimulate the economy has its limits um, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the, the uh, purely pricing as the, the source of uh, competitiveness in India may not be the only way to do it. There are many inefficiencies in, 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 in India uh, that need to be uh, uh, resolved. Uh, there are many things in ease of doing business that, could, uh, that need to be resolved. So yes, you can maybe a little bit, if, if the exchange rate was a little bit weaker, let's say, it would at best provide a temporary cushion to, during an adjustment process. But in the end, India has to be competitive in its own right. I don't think the exchange rate in itself uh, is the major constraint. Having okay. said that, yeah, sure. I mean, do you want the exchange rate to continuously appreciate from here on? Possibly not. Probably not, yeah. I Fair think enough. we should be very careful Godfrey, about please. depreciating the Indian currency. That has been the major cause for inflation in the past. And we don't want an inflationary economy for various reasons. Mm. So I think, but depreciating currency has not worked in any economy. And we should rely on the strength of the Indian rupee, if at all. And our foreign exchange reserves are rising. Yeah. Why do we need a depreciating currency? Export competitiveness should improve through other means, not through depreciating currency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Adi, there are many views, as you yeah, know. I, See, I, I agree. has both sides in that, but <laughs> largely, I think. But already okay. our currency has depreciated so much. I tell you what, yeah, let's work. Uh, could, currency yeah. in the world. Let's work this side of the room, just uh, so I don't ignore it. Uh, the gentleman in the spectacles. Hi, my name is Harish, and uh, I work in the education sector in a company called Pearson. Uh, my question is, uh, is not related to education but to the economy. A lot of what we want to drive in this country now rests with the states, uh, from education to healthcare to a lot of items. But as we move into this journey of uh, federal, uh, more, a more federal structure, we are seeing that the states are hamstrung by a lack of competence in various areas, right from managing cities to uh, managing hospitals to managing schools. How can we propel the economic engine in this country without really making the states more competent to run the economy? And your question is directed at who would you like Sanjeev. to respond? Sanjeev. Okay. Well, part of, uh, part of uh, federalism is that the central government doesn't sit around telling uh, 
the states what they should be doing. So uh, the, the way it has been done is that more resources have been allocated to the states as per the new formulas uh, for tax sharing. Um, and uh, they've been given a lot more autonomy. Um, now, the idea is that, uh, you know, um, unlike the old system where there was a planning commission and it sort of had sort of centralized all the uh, intellectual uh, firepower in one place, here that you provide the resources out and hopefully some of the states will experiment and do a somewhat better job. And then we will have a competitive federalism in the sense that that will uh, sort of inspire other states to improve themselves. Now, that takes a little bit of time, and I agree there are all kinds of competence issues. Mm. But you see, you can't have a central government acting, acting like a headmaster forever and telling everybody this is how you must go about it. The only way to get this going is to hand over resources, create transparency about what they are doing, and let them do it. And it is the case that some of the states, you know, different states are doing better things and different things. And over a period of time, this uh, process will, bil uh, will build out. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, give it a little bit of time to say that there is no competence at the state level. Yes, there will not be if you never let them do anything. Wow. Um, so the only way you will get more competence is because they will do a few things. A few of them will discover that they can do something better than others. Those people will get become famous and hopefully get asked by another state to come and do the same thing and so on and so forth. Okay, so learn and better yourself by actually trying. We've got time for one last question. Uh, the gentleman in the center, thank you. Uh, I'm Sanjay Kedia from uh, Marsh. If we, I can ask the question to the private sector representatives on the panel that uh, what would be one thing which government could should not have done or done differently with so many reforms going on, what could be the view on the panel over here? What could be one thing? And, and if I was to ask a, a supplementary to that, uh, and what could be one thing you would like to see the government should do to put the economy back on high growth? Wow, okay, Sanjeev first. I'm in the firing line. <laughs> so I already said the one thing, right, which was demonetization should have been done differently. Yes. The one thing that I think that they should do right now is, and there's a quick analogy there, a little extreme analogy. If you're a patient in an emergency room, you first need to be pumped with medicine to get you out of there. But the same medicines don't help you long term, so they can harm you. Mm. And we are not in an ER, so I must say that. But we are in a slower economy. There are, the reforms will always have a lag effect, right? So we'll see growth in a couple of years' time. We need some short term stimulus. Mm. And Sajiv may disagree with that because we know long term that doesn't help. Mm. But if I'm suffocating, give me some extra oxygen right now. Indeed. Okay, Mr. Godrich. Well, I think uh, uh, the GST is, to my mind, the biggest economic reform we've had since 1991. It'll be very good for the economy. It'll add very considerably to economic efficiency mm -hmm. and economic growth. And now we should ensure that we don't try and bring in what we might call other reforms which come in the way of its progress. There are many reforms that might be needed, but sometimes some of these small reforms mm -hmm. keep impeding proceeding growth. So I think we should go a little slow okay. in taking any risky action and let GST play its course. Okay. I feel it will play a good course. All right, Shobhan gets the last word. I think Prolif, uh, I would like to see the states being more efficient with the capital that they've been allocated, not squander it away. That's very important. Uh, a lot of the things that, that came in, uh, if we look at the past, the government should have actually looked at the NPA, resolved it earlier instead of, you know, all the, you know, all, all everything coming home at once. GST, DMON, all the banking system, all these, and I think that they have to start privatizing to get more capital. Um, they have to be careful in terms of how they manage the fiscal deficit. So those are the important things. Opening up, I think the, uh, the power, the infrastructure, all these sectors do need the oxygen that uh, Sanjeev is talking about. Mm. And the last thing, uh, we have to get our, uh, this education and training because if we don't have the right people to be trained for this future world, we're in deep trouble. Just educating them is not enough. It has to be the right skills 
for what's going to happen in this world and for India. Skilling, indeed. Totally agree, Shobna. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're just out of time. Thank you to our panelists, Shobna, Mr. Godridge, uh, uh, the two Sanjeevs as well, and thank you for being a part of this panel this year. We'll see you, uh, you. I guess, next year. Thank you. Thank you.